it's appropriate to uh, briefly address a central aspect that's been common to every topic that we've discussed in this course, namely the extent of deformations. Remember, we always assume that the deformations were small. But in many instances, that is not the case. In particular, if you look at soft biological tissue, and I don't really need to uh, pick a uh, specific specimen here, we have such specimens uh, on us all the time. So skin is an excellent example. Uh, we can easily deform skin. And uh, so the deformations are certainly not small. Strains are certainly not small. And moreover, you'll notice that deformations are not quite elastic because when I let go, you see that the skin eventually recovers over time. And that's going to take quite a while, sometime at least, to complete the recovery. So we see something like viscoelasticity, at least at the level of phenomenological level, let's say, that we are observing whatever is going on, we can attribute that or model that as viscoelasticity. Uh, now, um, but we would like to just model or concentrate presently on the deformation aspect. So while um, biological tissue I'm talking about here soft biological tissue like skin, organs, muscles. Uh, they are a prime example to uh, large deformations. Um, and we want to concentrate on only elastic deformations. Well, soft polymers likewise are a good example. And a specimen that we used earlier also at this point is appropriate to remember briefly uh, what, the, what, what, what we talk about when we mention eventually or when we will mention large elastic deformation. So here's a specimen, right? I can pull on it for quite a bit and increase at least in the gauge portion, the strain can go up to almost two, right? 200% elongation and maybe even more if I pull more. Uh, but eventually you see that first of all, when I let go, the specimen appears to recover all of its deformation. So at least I don't see any visible permanent deformation. And I'm gonna assume in the following that when we are trying to model this type of deformation and we're just gonna model uh, one dimensional deformations, somehow we'll try to extend Hooke's law in its very basic form. Uh, and, and, and when we try to model such deformations, of course, of course, as I pull and depending on the specimen's nature and how much I pull, it's conceivable that I pull it so much that somehow I induce some uh, let's say irreversible deformation, not necessarily associated with permanent deformation, but something something irreversible such that the material is, let's say, damaged. That is a good keyword, actually, damage uh, the specimen and its material behavior changes. It's different as I pull and I let it go, such that the network I do is not equal to zero, such that I wouldn't really be able to talk about elasticity. But what I'm going to assume is that when I pull and it's very large deformation and I let go, the net amount of work is completely recovered. And for me, that's going to define elasticity. And as I do that, I'm going to concentrate on only an extension of basic hooks. Though we could sort of concentrate on simple shear stress versus shear strain behavior in a sort of similar fashion, but I'm just going to make use of um, normal stress and strain. And what we're going to talk about is nonlinear elasticity. Elastic behavior that does not follow ultimately the linear response that is predicted with the Hooke's law, where stress is linear to the amount of strain. It's not going to be linear anymore. And as I said, soft biological tissue is a very good um, uh, motivation for what we're about to do and likewise uh, soft polymers as well. And again, because this topic actually does not appear at all in your book, I'm gonna address and mention the key concepts associated with this topic in a series of well, let's say, karyographed steps. And so let's start with step number one and we're gonna first make some experimental observations because that's ultimately the starting point um, of any modeling approach. And our experiment is going to be based on um, 
uh, rabbit skin. So skin is a good example, as I just mentioned. So uh, I just took this book, uh, this, this, this reference out of a, a book by a famous biomechanician named Fung, F-U-N-G. And so that's a classical reference. And so we have rabbit skin. Uh, it almost looks like a plate. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to um, fix that rabbit skin. Um, and we're going to do two different types of experiments. We're going to first fix it along one direction. Okay. And that's going to be, let's say, the extraction. And I'm going to pull on it by a certain value, which I'm going to indicate with lambda x. I'll soon define what lambda uh, means in this context. Then I'm going to fix the skin on the other surface. And I'm going to pull along the other direction by a certain amount lambda. And that's going to be the y direction. So let's call that lambda uh, y. So first of all, uh, let me quickly define what lambda is. Well, lambda is the ratio of the current length of a specimen in a certain direction divided by the initial length. Okay, um, And that initial length, so the, the expression that we have in this form, it's similar to something that we've seen before because the ratio is the initial length plus the change in length divided by the initial length, or in other words, it's simply 1 plus the engineering strain. So that's the way uh, we can define what is called a stretch. So epsilon is the engineering strain, lambda is called the stretch. We're defining this quantity and using it prefer to use it over 1 plus epsilon because it's classically the parameter that is used in nonlinear elastic. So it's just customary quantity that appears in the formulation. So then we're imposing a certain stretch, right? And what we noticed, first of all, is that the stretch is, well, let's make two points here. One, uh, the stretch is obviously a quantity that lies in the range zero theoretically to infinite. Of course, it's not going to be very, very extremely large, but it's going to be eventually very large, very large deformation. That's the reason I'm putting infinity there, not really that it goes to infinity, but it's certainly not going to be small. In other words, the strain that we're going to look at, they're not going to be small. Because if we were, then we'd be dealing with small deformation or linear elasticity. But we want to look at large deformation and hence the name nonlinear elasticity. And the second thing we notice is that epsilon zero, in other words, no deformation corresponds to lambda equals one. Okay, so that's no deformation. Okay, so we've introduced this alternative measure of deformation on um, the stretch. And now we're going to plot the results of this experiment. There are two sets of exper two experiments, right? One pulling only along x direction, two pulling only along y direction. And we're going to uh, plot the curve. And what we're measuring is deformation, which we're going to plot in terms of the stretch and versus we're going to plot the force that we will measure. Okay, Instead of some measure of stress, we're going to plot the force. We could certainly have plotted the engineering stress, but I'm plotting the force for a reason. Um, so that's the force. Notice the units, m and so that's milli Newton. So we're talking about small forces. Um, if there is no deformation, so if lambda is equal to 1, no deformation, the force we expect it to be 0. Um, the deformations can be very large, so I'm going to put here just as an indicator value of 2.0. So those are large deformations. Okay. Um, and some reference value in between, let's say 1.5. So that's 50% uh, strain, that's 100% strain if you like. And then we plot the results of the experiment. And so first, the results for... Um, the force that we measure along the extraction when we stretch only along the extraction. So it turns out the curve roughly goes like this. So you start off with small forces at small stretches. Maybe you zoom in and you see a line, the kind of line that you would expect to see 
if you had a linear material behavior because deformation is proportional to the amount of force that you generate. And on the other hand here, eventually what you see is some rapid increase in the force after a certain point. And certainly now, the deformation is inducing a force that is not anymore linear in the deformation, but highly nonlinear. However, you can load in this case, but when you remove the, the, remove the force or you remove the deformation, you go back, it turns out, to zero deformation at corresponding to zero stress, which suggests that this deformation is elastic. Now, again, let me remind you, in reality, you'll probably see some viscoelasticity, and in reality, you'll probably see some irreversible type of um, deformation induced on the material or behavior induced such as so-called damage but here we're concentrating on elastic so what we understand is we recover all the work that we put in the area under the curve is going to be the work that we put in and eventually um, so we recover all of that work which indicates elastic type of material behavior okay but it's just that the force deformation relation is not linear anymore and that's the difference so that is our f of x curve now we do the same experiment with the y direction and what we see is a curve that looks like this so again the curve starts off almost flat so when we zoom in we probably would see a line but notice that already the line is not quite going to have the same slope at small deformations, which suggests that perhaps the stiffnesses in both directions are different. And moreover, when you pull in the other direction, again, ultimately, you see a deviation from that initial elastic behavior. And that deviation is also one that rapidly gives to highly increasing stress. And when you load in that direction, you increase the force but when you unload again you recover all of the force or the work that you put in in other words deformations appear to be elastic so that is the experiment fy so what we observed from this experiment overall is well uh, first of all we are looking at very large deformations or very large stretches you can say stretches or strains. Um, two, rather small forces. We are of the order of millinewtons. If you were to induce such, if you tried to even could induce such large deformations on a piece of metal or a very stiff polymer, a hard polymer, let's say, um, then we can imagine that the forces are going to be much larger. We're looking at very small forces. And finally, the stress strain, the force deformation and hence ultimately stress strain behavior is expected to be, is observed to be nonlinear, uh, which is something we will have to model. Again, remember, as soon as we use Hooke's law, deformation force or deformation load curve is always linear. Amount of load, amount of extension, the axial force, amount of angle change, the amount of bending moment, the amount of twist, the amount of torque, those relations are always linear. Now it's nonlinear. Okay, so that's what we are highlighting, and that's probably the most important keyword that we have here. So nonlinear force deformation curve versus what again always the linear case. The linear case is where you have a relation between force and deformation. Okay, so that is lambda. That's zero force. And eventually, if I observe a line that goes like that, eventually that's a linear relation. Eventually, perhaps in some region, in particular at very, very small deformations, in other words, within, let's say, this region in the plot, I might eventually end up seeing such a line. I'm going to comment on that shortly. But the requirement is eventually that the deformations should be small. In other words, I should never try to go up to such very large uh, strains. And that indeed is the essence of linear elasticity. We expect a linear relation because deformations are tiny. And by tiny, we mean less than a percent strain, perhaps. Okay, tiny, tiny strains versus 50 or 100 percent strain. Now, this is what we would like to not focus on next.
And again, I'm going to do it in a way that will give you a glimpse into this topic of nonlinear elasticity. And I'll pick certain uh, mathematical formulations that will be helpful in motivating. Certainly, this would not be the most robust way of doing it, but I think it will give you a good idea about um, this topic.